Hello, my name is Audrey Scanlon. I'm the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Central Pennsylvania, making this video for you for May 6th in the year 2022. And we are in the second of a series of videos that I'm calling AMA, Ask Me Anything. We started last week and I invited you to send me questions that you would like me to address to ask the bishop at diocesecpa.org, ask the bishop at diocesecpa.org. And I got quite a few submissions last week of really, really good questions to answer for you. I'm only gonna to get to one of them this week and we'll reply to maybe a couple of them by email, but um, it's been a good turnout so far. And I'd like to start with what I think of all of the questions that I got is the hardest question, the meatiest question that I got. From, from the submissions last week, and it's about the theology of the atonement. The writer said to me, what is the Episcopal understanding of the theology of the atonement? And so before I get into that, with a little bit of teaching, a little bit of review for, for those of us who have, it's been a while since we've been in Sunday school maybe, and maybe we've never studied the different theologies of atonement, but I would start by saying that one of the beauties, one of the hallmarks of the Anglican tradition, of the Episcopal tradition, is that we have a, a broad understanding, a breadth of, of what we consider to be acceptable, if you will, theologies within our Episcopal Church. We say that we are the via media, that we, that we oftentimes represent the middle way, but that doesn't mean that we don't also embrace uh, both ends of a spectrum of understanding and ideas on any number of social issues, as well as theological issues and liturgical practices and even individual piety. So I think that my first answer about what is the theology, the Episcopal theology or understanding of the atonement, uh, the answer might be a bit of a coy yes. Yes, we believe in a lot of different things. And what I'd like to share with you now in this video is some of the ways that that's expressed in our Book of Common Prayer and the way that we worship together, because you'll see that we do embrace um, rather the whole spectrum. And so when we talk about atonement, what we're talking about is, uh, some people would call it the salvific work of Christ, the work of the Messiah, who came for us to save our sins. There's a church that I pass by as I come to Harrisburg each morning, and it's, it's in my town of Mechanicsburg. I drive by it and the sign outside yesterday as I was driving along, it said, Jesus paid a debt he did not owe. Jesus paid a debt he did not owe. And that, in essence, is one take on the theology of atonement. So when we're talking about atonement, at one meant is how it's spelled, we talk about becoming whole again, becoming um, reconciled, reunited, um, restored to wholeness and unity through Christ in God. Our Jewish brothers and sisters celebrate Yom Kippur, which is for them the Day of Atonement in which they recognize their human frailty and, and the need for um, finding that wholeness again. In our tradition, we have, of course, a whole season of Lent. We have our general confession that we say on Sunday. And if you pray the daily office, you may begin each day with a confession. And so this understanding of frailty sinfulness of separation from God is not new to us and the yearning to be whole again, to be united with God, that's really at one meant. Um, that's, that's the goal. That's the goal of what I would say is the whole God project is coming back into wholeness. And the theology of atonement looks at the point at which um, God the Creator surveyed humankind and said it's time to intervene in a way in which 
we had not been intervened with uh, before, and you all know John 3.16, for God so loved the world that God sent his only begotten son. So that's the understanding of what we're talking about when we talk about atonement, is this understanding that Jesus had a purpose, that God's will was for Jesus to come and be among us. But even within that theology, there's lots of different gradations and um, different ideas. One of them, for example, is this idea that through Christ, um, we have paid the ransom to Satan in order for us to be free, that we had uh, were held in bondage by evil, by Satan, the evil one, and by paying the price of Christ's death, we have been, have been set free. There is um, an idea, a recapitulation theory in which Jesus comes as the new Adam and does it all over again and gets it right this time. There is the most popular um, theory or theology of atonement is from St. Anselm, and his theory is the satisfaction theory that Jesus was sent to us to redeem us, that um, only God in God's self had the capacity to, um, to free us from the weight and the um, grandiosity of our sin. And so God sent a divine being, Jesus being fully human, fully divine. Only through a divine being could we be saved. And so that's the satisfaction theory that Anselm talks about. I'll point out to you a little bit in our prayer book about where we see that, but but you might wonder what some of the objections are to this. It's certainly something that, that trips off of our tongue, that Jesus died for us. It's, it's not a new idea. But some of the objections are that what kind of God, what kind of Father God would send his son to um, be sacrificed on our behalf. There's another idea that that only I can uh, make up for my own moral failings, that nobody else could do that for me, so that moral guilt is not transferable. Um, there's other objections that, why couldn't God just forgive us? Why did we need to go through the pain and the suffering of, of, um, of nailing Jesus to the cross? So there are objections to this satisfaction theory, which is the most popular theory, uh, but the whole idea of atonement to begin with. Now our prayer book espouses this theology of atonement. I'd like to share with you some of what we read in our Eucharistic prayer each Sunday, what we pray, because it's very much a part of who we are. In prayer A, we talk about the obedience and sacrifice of Christ when we say that when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, God in God's mercy sent Jesus Christ to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, to be that agent of atonement. In prayer B, which is another prayer that we pray frequently, the idea is more on the deliverance that Jesus brings us. We say in him, in Christ, we have been delivered from evil. Prayer C, I think, is the one actually in which we echo the, the highest form of atonement when we say, by his blood he reconciled us, and by his stripes, or pardon me, by his wounds we are healed. By his stripes we are healed. You may recognize that as a phrase from the Hebrew scriptures. And so throughout our Eucharistic prayer, we hear again and again um, the salvific work of Christ. And then in prayer D, we hear about sacrifice. We also hear about something that we call the Christus Victor, or the victory of Christ over death. We say, to fulfill your purpose, he gave himself up to death. So to ask the question of what is our take on it, well, we are people of the prayer book, 
and uh, we are people of liturgy. We lex, lex orandi, lex credendi is a saying, which is what we believe is how we pray, and how we pray is what we believe. And so I would say that um, the theology of atonement is very much within our scripture, and I would say that we are hanging on to that Anselmian idea of the satisfaction that Christ made for us. In our catechism, we know the catechism in the back of the prayer book is really an outline of the faith, and that answer about what is the great importance of Jesus' suffering and death, that question, is answered and it hits all of the high notes about atonement. It says, by his obedience, even to suffering and death, Jesus made the offering, which we could not make, so that satisfaction idea, and in him we are freed from the power of sin, and we are reconciled to God. So that answer really hits all of those big themes of sacrifice, of reconciliation, of satisfaction, of the Christus Victor, and the, the meta theme of reconciliation. So those are some of the places that we think about atonement in our prayer book in our practicing lives as Christians. I would say for me, and of course each of us will, will decide where we fit on that spectrum of understanding and, and uh, belief. For me, one of the things, the visual things that I notice as I travel in our Episcopal churches is that the crosses in our churches, the crosses on our altars, the crosses in the apse of our, con of, of our churches, are empty crosses. They are crosses of victory. As opposed to uh, when we travel in mostly Roman Catholic churches and we see crucifixes. We see the emphasis in other faith traditions that, that have crucifixes on display. Um, the focus on the sacrifice, on the death, on the um, and the, the passion of Christ, as opposed to what I prefer to dwell on, which is the, the, um, what we have won by Christ's death, which is the victory over death, which is eternal life. So for me and my piety, I focus both on what Marcus Borg would call the pre-Easter Jesus, which is the teaching of the Rabbi Jesus who taught us how to love, and I focus on the post-Easter Jesus, which is the Jesus who is the resurrected Jesus, who uh, has brought us eternal life. So I hope that's helpful for you. It is, as I said earlier, a really meaty, meaty question for a 10 or 15 minute video, but I do appreciate it. And next week we'll dive into another question. If you've got something you'd like to talk about, um, email me at askthebishop at diocesecpa.org. Let me close with a prayer for guidance from our prayer book. Direct us, O Lord, in all our doings with thy most gracious favor and further us with thy continual help that in all our works begun, continued, and ended in thee, we may glorify thy holy name and finally by thy mercy obtain everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so until next week, when we'll dig into another question, my prayer is that God will bless you and guide you and keep you always.